So welcome to the session. We're going to have two presentations. Uh, the first one is by Simon University of Warwick, and uh, he'll be presenting on resource rights in the Anthropocene. Simon. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. And um, yeah, a big thank you to the organizers of the uh, of the conference and for, for putting this on when I know it's been uh, even more work than is normally the case because of all of the complications to do with COVID and pandemics. Um, before I begin, I have to say something slightly idiosyncratic, which is, uh, uh, and, and Michelle will have heard this before, but I have a, a very old cat who is in this room. And my experience of teaching um, teams over the last year has taught me that when he gets bored, uh, and he does get bored when I'm talking, he starts to make this horrible noise. And so if I stop for uh, 15 seconds, it's because I'm trying to bribe him to remain quiet. You, you'll know it when it happens, if it happens, but he's asleep at the moment. Okay, um, so the, uh, the question at the heart of this paper is um, you know, what implications does the, the global environmental catastrophe that we're facing have for the question of rights over resources? Um, I should perhaps add, I put in the chat function um, a PDF of the handout. So I'm hoping, um, well, certainly those online can, can access that. Uh, and it's quite long and that is to enable me to speak for less. Okay, so to get back, the question really then is, if we uh, are serious about tackling uh, the climate crisis amongst other environmental crises, what implications does this have for the institution of private property? And the way I've thought about it is to start with um, climate change, and I'm going to ignore, for simplicity's sake, other environmental global challenges, like uh, biodiversity loss and ocean acidification and so on. But I'm going to start with climate change and try and work back from that and to see what implications various policies have for the ownership of, of resources. Um, and I'm going to begin by uh, looking at the view that says it doesn't really have any implications for private property. Uh, and then I'm going to look at four arguments which push back against that in different ways. I, I do think it may be helpful to begin uh, by just putting these things into a bigger context. And the bigger context is that there are increasingly people asking questions like, well, can capitalism cope with, um, oh, okay, yeah, so I, I noticed now you can, uh, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, so some people are asking, can capitalism cope with climate change? And uh, Nancy Fraser, for example, has recently published um, a paper arguing that in built into capitalism is a dynamic which, um, is hostile to protecting the climate system. And um, she has a book coming out next year on it. It's a theme that you find in some Marxist work and she references um, James O'Connor, who in the late 80s argued that there was a second contradiction in capitalism, that capitalism led to undermining its own conditions of existence. So there's this really big question about whether Capitalism can cope with climate change, but one crucial part of this is, well, can, um, can private property uh, cope with uh, climate change or do we need a different system of property? Uh, if you want to know where we're heading, I don't really come to a firm conclusion on that. What I think is whatever property system you have, whether it's private or some version of common, it must have limits built into it. And so my own verdict is somewhat neutral on whether uh, we must abolish private property in some form. It's really that whatever property system, there have to be constraints built into it. Otherwise, we are not going to be able to cope with the problem. OK, let me just say a few other things by way of background. So when thinking about responding justly to climate change, um, I think it's useful to have a couple of background assumptions made visible. And one is people often talk about things uh, like um, avoiding dangerous climate change, which, which is pretty vague. Uh, I think we need some idea of the just target. And for me, the, the just target is that um, 
condition of the climate such that we do egalitarian justice to current and future generations. So I think we should not leave future generations with a world less good than our own. And I think this requires uh, something like a 1.5 degree target, and it requires going to zero carbon as, as quickly as possible. So that's what I mean by just target. And secondly, we can't just meet that, we have to do it in a just way and distribute any burdens and benefits equitably. So there's a just burden sharing component. And, and on my view, uh, the moral compass that should guide this is an egalitarian conception of justice. So this would say that the costs of transition should be borne by the most advantaged because they're the most advantaged and in order to create a more equal world. I don't think anything else that I'm gonna say later on depends crucially on that. And you can put in your own preferred theory of justice, but um, just so you know where I'm coming from, that's where I'm gonna come from. Okay, so section two, um, you know, our question was, well, what implications does climate change have for the institution of private property? I think many mainstream economists would say none really, Look at the policy instruments we can use and should use. These don't require rethinking the institution of private property. And the way many economists have framed it is to think about three types of policy instrument, quantity, prices, and regulations. And so quantity restrictions are, you just limit the amount of emissions that can be released. And then you have a system of trading, trading permits to emit. Or you could have quantity with no trading, but no one really favours that, I don't think. Or a second instrument would be having carbon taxes, just putting a price on the use of carbon. Or a third is uh, a regulation, so having mandatory energy efficiency standards or mand mandatory use of biofuels, um, to take an EU example. But my skeptic says, look, but none of these really require rethinking the institution of private property. We've got it covered with these. Um, and someone might flesh this out a bit more and look at other kinds of um, things that should be adopted. Like, uh, for example, we subsidize uh, fossil fuels to an enormous degree. And someone might say, well, look, uh, one thing we should clearly do is eradicate fossil fuel subsidies. And, and don't they might say, kid yourself that this is good because it protects um, poorer consumers. It doesn't, it, it disproportionately uh, protects uh, the more affluent. And they might say, look, we, we need to have deploy renewables, we need to have electrification, we need research and development into clean technology, uh, and so on and so forth. But none of this really requires rethinking the basic institutions of capitalism or private property. And, and I think that that probably is a mainstream view amongst uh, climate economists and policymakers. But now I want to ask whether that was really a bit too quick. And um, here's, here's the first argument, uh, which pushes back directly against that. As I said, there are going to be four. So the first argument says, well, one thing that's not visible in that description so far is that the system is absolutely dependent on a system of property rights. And we can see this all the way through. We can see this if we begin at the extractive process. It assumes that some people have an entitlement to extract, extract fossil fuels from the ground. And it assumes um, that we can transport it over ground. And that's politically been, both of those have been quite controversial. And indeed only recently the, um, the Keystone XL pipeline, which was going from Alberta um, through the US. Only recently, after 10 years of protests, has that been stopped. But it's been contested all the way by various environmental groups, indigenous groups, uh, some farmers, because of the havoc that the transportation of oil does to their lands. So the point I'm trying to make is the carbon economy presupposes um, or relies on a certain system of rights, including extraction, transportation, and burning of the stuff. And I want to focus on the burning of the stuff because um, one argument that I think could be advanced is that the system presupposes that we have, uh, or individuals can have private property rights 
in the absorptive capacity of the atmosphere. And I think the best way to introduce the line of argument is to talk about emissions trading schemes. So uh, imagine you have one of these schemes such as exists in Europe, for example, you have a permit to uh, emit and so to release greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere. And I think one objection goes as follows. It says, that's privatizing something and it's privatizing something that should be collectively owned. And it, what it's privatizing is the use of the atmosphere to absorb uh, CO2. So someone might say, and critics often do say, look, these schemes commodify or privatize the atmosphere. Now, sometimes people say in reply, and, and actually I've said this in reply, and I would now want to qualify it a bit, but look, the right isn't a property right in the atmosphere, it's more like a use right. Because what you do is you release some carbon, but it gets absorbed, uh, and then the slate is wiped clean, and um, you don't own anything out there. Um, what it is, is equivalent to having the use right to I don't know, use a bit of land to grow a crop and you grow your crop and then you move on once um, the land has replenished. But this seems to me now um, mistaken and, and incomplete because of a, a scientific fact about carbon emissions. And uh, we're now on to uh, yeah, um, some passages from David Archer, who's a climate uh, scientist who, who points out that when you emit a ton of CO2, a quarter of that ton is still affecting the climate a thousand years from now, and 10% of the CO2 from that ton will be affecting the climate in 100,000 years. And so I think the image of it being a use right where you have a, a time limited um, use of something which then can be employed by others. It is very misleading here because, uh, you know, de facto, you're taking up something that could have been used by others um, for all time. I mean, a thousand years or a hundred thousand years, uh, they really are equivalent to your permanent possession or your permanent use. So it, it's kind of a bit misleading then to say that emitting isn't... Uh, taking up or using or consuming part of the absorptive capacity, um, it is. I mean, some of it isn't, some of it gets absorbed more quickly and gases like methane, which are very powerful, are much more short lived. So um, you could perhaps conceive of methane as a temporary use, right? But the verdict then is that we should see carbon permits as a sort of hybrid, they're partly use rights, but they're partly de facto private property rights. And then the critic will say, um, but look, the atmosphere and its absorptive capacity should be regarded as belonging to the global commons. And, and this was put forward um, forcefully in a, a seminal contribution by Anil Agarwal and Sunita Narain who likened the climate problem to a form of uh, ecological imperialism, that it was an overuse of a, a commons resource by a certain group of people. And they were essentially privatizing for their own use that which should be enjoyed by everyone. So just to keep the question in focus, someone asks, well, should we rethink the institution of private property? One reply is, well, uh, at the moment, what we've got is a system that treats what should be regarded as in common as privately ownable, and that's wrong. But how, how should we proceed from this? Because actually what uh, Anil Agawal and Senator Narain argued was, in a sense that we could privatize it as long as we distributed it fairly amongst people. And so they favored a system, which many environmental activists have subsequently followed of just um, saying the atmosphere can absorb this amount, we should share it out equally amongst all persons. And so they start from a position of common ownership, but move to a system of individual private use. I, I don't agree with that um, for two reasons. Uh, one is 
for reasons that they were unaware of then, that the stock that can be emitted is fixed. Um, most climate scientists um, accept that, uh, in fact, I think all climate scientists accept that, that there's a, a limited volume that can be emitted precisely because it lasts in the atmosphere for so long. And one figure often given is a trillion tons of carbon. And we've already used more than half of that. And we are on track to finish the remaining bit in the next decade. And if someone says, well, we should just take this fixed stock and share it amongst all persons, current and presumably future, the amount that anyone can emit is going to be unknowable because we don't know how many future people there are going to be and, and, and tiny because however many future people there are going to be, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be quite a lot. So I don't think we should go for an equal per capita distribution. But the, and the second reason, which to my mind is more significant even than that, is that it's distributing what doesn't really matter. What really matters are people's um, meeting important interests and needs. And fossil fuels are used as a means to secure those with a, this externality of emitting green, greenhouse gases. But, but the greenhouse gases aren't what really matter. What really matters is meeting these needs. And if we can meet these needs and interests in other ways, that's what we should do. So I think it's a fetishism to borrow uh, a kind of a line of argument given by Amartya Sen in, an, in another debate to focus on the emissions. What we should really focus on is people's access to agriculture and to energy. And it's a mistake then to divvy up portions of atmospheric space to all individuals. So where does this leave us then? I, I think it, that Agarwal and Arena are right to think of it as something that belongs to humanity in some sense, but I think they're wrong to try and privatize it. Um, various positions someone might take here. So one taken by uh, Peter Barnes and a, a series of co-authors, including Eleanor Ostrom and Oren Young, was to say, why don't we just auction off permits to emit greenhouse gases? And then we can share the proceeds of that in some cases to alleviate poverty, in other cases to fund clean technology, in other cases to enable adaptation. But we treat it um, as a, an earth atmospheric trust to be used for the benefit of humanity. I think that's quite an attractive vision. Uh, others might say, no, you can, you can use this common resource as long as you offset it through afforestation or reforestation. Others might say, look, you can use this common resource if you create substitutes like clean energy. So starting from the premise that it's a common heritage of humanity, there are different routes you could go down. But rather than adjudicate between these, I want to draw attention to another point, which is um, if we just go back to the claim I made a minute ago about us having this fixed carbon budget and we're rapidly using it up, I think for the immediate future and for the long term, the, the lesson of that is we've got to stop thinking about it as a resource at all. Um, yeah, it might have made sense writing in the early 1990s to think how can we share it out, and it still does for the very immediate future. But in the long term, it seems we, we are reaching um, total absorptive capacity. In fact, maybe we've reached it already. And so we need to stop thinking of it as something as a resource to be used, whether privately or communally or in any other way. Uh, it's all used up. So um, I think we've kind of reached then two, two verdicts or two claims I want to make on the basis of this first argument. I mean, one is that from the Industrial Revolution onwards uh, until the present day, this, this shared um, resource, the absorptive capacity of the atmosphere, has been treated as a de facto private property right to those who get there first. And that whatever criteria you have of just appropriation, it doesn't meet that. Because those who've used it haven't compensated it by engaging in reforestation. They haven't provided substitute technologies. They haven't auctioned it off and shared the proceeds amongst all humanity. And then the second kind of claim I think we should draw from what I've just said is that while in the past we could have seen it as a shared common resource, 
in the future, we should stop thinking of it as a resource at all. There's a big kind of caveat I should add, which is this is assuming we don't um, increase up to scale things like carbon dioxide removal and uh, carbon capture and storage, which would prolong the extent to which humanity can emit carbon dioxide. And, um, and I'm gonna note that, but I'm gonna set that aside. So yeah, let me then kind of pull some threads together. Uh, we've had the, the skeptic who says, look, this really doesn't raise questions of private property. And then we've had a critic that says, yes, it does, because um, all systems that allow people to emit greenhouse gases are in a sense, allowing people to privatize this phenomenon, the atmosphere, and um, that's wrong on two counts. Now, one lesson I think uh, that comes from that is we should stop thinking about the atmosphere as like a dumping ground where we can just put our pollution, put our carbon emissions. I think that connects with the second argument because the first argument says something like don't treat the atmosphere as like a shared resource. The, the second argument says, um, there might be limits on whether you can extract fossil fuels in the first place. So let, let me move to that, um, that second argument. So let's, let's begin with an empirical observation. And it, it comes from a very influential and widely cited paper by Christoph McGlade and Paul Eakins that says, um, even given quite modest climate targets, like a two degree increase and, and keeping beneath that, uh, a huge amount of oil, gas, and coal should stay in the ground. Uh, a third of oil reserves, half of gas reserves, over 80% of current coal reserves should remain unused. Now, bearing this in mind, many people, um, including many activists, say, well, look, uh, why fiddle around with things like carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes? Why don't we just tackle it at root and keep them in the ground. Uh, Peter Newell, for example, and uh, Andrew Sims um, have called for there to be a sort of fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty where states just agree not to extract the fossil fuels in their jurisdiction. And um, I put a website where you can um, read a manifesto along those lines uh, and sign up and support it. So, uh, the proposal often made then is that states shouldn't grant extraction rights to company owning land with fossil fuels and states themselves shouldn't extract fossil fuels. Um, and in, you might, in line with your theory of justice, add some principles of compensation to some on just terms. So if you've got poor communities who are dependent on the extraction of fossil fuels, then uh, there's a powerful case, uh, I think an overwhelming case in my view, for there to be uh, investment and compensation so that their ability to achieve an equal standard of living is uh, furthered and, and not impeded. Um, now, this idea isn't that new. I mean, it was floated in um, uh, earlier this century in, in Ecuador, and there was a proposal uh, called the Yasuni ITT proposal. And, um, this is an area which is very rich in fossil fuels, but it's also a biodiversity hotspot. And uh, there was a proposal made by some e ecologists to keep the fossil fuels in the ground as long as sufficient compensation was paid to um, make it worth their while. And this would seem to be a part of a, like a just transition. We protect the climate by keeping it under the ground, but we compensate those who are disadvantaged already from being even further disadvantaged. But um, there wasn't sufficient money generated, and so the, the plan uh, folded, and, and I put some references there if you want to follow up on the politics of that and the critiques of that. I think many ecologists and indigenous people's representatives were quite critical of Rafael Correa for not really believing in the proposal. But anyway, the point is some people would say we should just keep it in the ground. But then this poses the question, what if someone says, oh, um, I don't want to keep it in the ground. <laughs> we can make money here. And in fact, this was, I think, Rafael Correa's view. He, 
he originally sort of said, uh, we have this fan fantastically valuable resource and our economy is dependent on exporting it. Why would we uh, immiserate ourselves? But a climate activist might say, but look, it's so important to protect the climate that it's just of paramount significance to keep it in the ground. And so then we have an intersection with the question of property rights, because could someone say there's an enforceable limit, there's a prohibition on extracting fossil fuels? And I note some conditions that you might add to this, or at least morally relevant criteria you might want to bear in mind before endorsing this. So one, of course, is you'd want to know that this was actually going to be effective at mitigating climate change. A second condition you might have is that this is either necessary for preventing climate change, or um, if it's not necessary because there are other measures, it's better than the other measures. Uh, or you might want to add that any kind of harm done is not disproportionate given the moral gain. And you might want to add a principle of just compensation. And this would say that those who've been um, disadvantaged, who have a legitimate claim, are entitled to compensation. So poor workers dependent for their livelihood on extraction or poor communities dependent on the export of fossil fuels have claims. Um, oil rich countries, um, on the other hand, who've impeded the climate process at every step and the climate negotiations don't because they have more than their fair share. So um, what I'm trying to suggest then is I guess someone could make a case for constricting property rights by saying it's either necessary or very important to protect the climate to do this, and it can be justified if there's appropriate Ooh compensation. Um, I don't think it gives us a reason to favour one kind of property system over another, whether it's private or collective. Um, some people have suggested that a system of common ownership would fare better on this front. But um, I'm not sure why that would be the case, because the, the members of the, the community might think, as Correa thought, that uh, they could benefit enormously from, from using it. So I think it's independent of what property system one has that one could construct an argument for preventing people from extracting fossil fuels. I think you might link this argument with the very first argument because if there is no more um, absorptive capacity in the atmosphere, um, then what justification could there be for extracting something whose um, effect will be to absorb you know, to, to emit more greenhouse gases. As I said, the only caveat would be that um, if there are ways of carbon capture and storage or carbon dioxide removal, that complicates the argument. But I think someone giving my second argument might just say it's the most efficient and effective way of realizing the goals of the first argument. Okay, so um, I've looked at two arguments so far. One is about commodifying the atmosphere and the other one is about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. But we need alternatives, we need substitutes. And that takes us to argument number three, because um, on any plausible trajectory, we're going to need lots of renewables and renewables depend on natural resources. And um, these natural resources are scattered all over the world. They're often mined in incredibly dangerous ways that have harmful ecological effects and involve violations of labor rights. But the thought I'm gonna give here is as follows. If we're serious about tackling climate change, we need to decarbonize. If we are to decarbonize, we need, for example, cobalt, copper, lithium, cadmium, rare earth elements, because these are needed for solar vo photovoltaics, they're needed for batteries, they're needed for electric vehicles, wind turbines, fuel cells. Um, and uh, there's no guarantee under the current system uh, that everyone can have fair access to these kind of renewables or means needed for renewables. So I think um, the suggestion I want to make here is that we need to 
kind of reconfigure resource rights over these kinds of resources so that they meet two criteria. Um, one is so that there is access so that all can decarbonize. Otherwise, we, we don't meet the just target. And the second is that the extractive process and the conditions under which it is done um, uh, uh, weaken inequalities and create greater equality, and they don't follow the, the current model, which is they tend to um, harm the most vulnerable. But again, I think this is calling for a limitation on, on property systems, because what if someone has some very valuable minerals needed for decarbonization, but would refuse to, to sell them or charge us extortionate prices? And then on the proposal I'm getting, well, I, I don't think they have the right to do that because they don't have a just entitlement to, um, to act in a way that either impedes the transition to decarbonization or that imposes unjust burdens on others in decarbonizing. And I know even the stalwart, you know, libertarian Robert Nozick would allow that there are limits on whether someone who owns land can deprive them of others. Um, whether it's, let's say, an oasis that's the only oasis in the world. So here's the claim then, a just response to climate change requires redesigning the ownership and access rights to natural resources so that we can A, decarbonize and B, do so justly. And now I want to move on to a fourth and, and final um, claim. And again, what I'm trying to do is to start from the climate problem and then work downwards and think, well, what does this really mean for rights over resources? And I want to bring technology into the picture because it will play a role, but I haven't mentioned it so far. One interesting thing about technology, and, and I'll just make this in passing uh, because it's often neglected, is that uh, representatives of developing countries have been um, campaigning on clean technology transfer for you know, 40 to 50 years. And so I include the, uh, Mohammed Bajroy's um, Towards a New International Economic Order, which was uh, a seminal text underlying the, the proposal for a new international economic order. And there he was arguing um, that you know, resource, sorry, natural, so I'll start again. There he was arguing that there should be technology transfer from affluent parts of the world to um, uh, less affluent, in partly because of compensation. But he wasn't talking about climate. And so I want to link this now to climate and to explain why I think we need to have a sort of a global technological commons if we're to tackle climate change. And, and there are three arguments that I think converge on the same conclusion, but do so in slightly different ways. So argument one goes as follows. It says, well, you know, look at the portion of the planet that lacks any access to electricity. Um, and they're told we, we need to curb energy use as a species, otherwise we trigger dangerous climate change. They can legitimately say on any plausible account of global justice that they have a right to develop and lift themselves out of poverty. But they've been put into a situation such that if they do that using fossil fuels, um, it will trigger dangerous climate change. And so I think then the onus is on those who are affluent, whose affluence will have come about through using up um, the atmosphere to fund alternatives. So in this way, we can get development and, um, and protect the climate system. Because without that, we either have um, uh, runaway climate change because we have development, but no mitigation, or we have mitigation, but no development. And so we have an unjust world of lingering poverty and um, gross inequality. And the only way to square that circle is to have clean technology transfer. That's argument number one. Argument number two says, think about it from the point of view of future people who, who want to inherit a world which is um, a, got a stable climate in. Uh, if we want to assure such a world to them, then we ought to transfer clean technology to developing countries um, because they will develop, they will grow economically. And the only question is how. And if, if we don't transfer clean technology, then um, 
then what we're saying to future generations is we're, we're going down a route where uh, we're not going to protect you. We're not transferring the clean technology that would be needed to protect future people's interests and rights. So that differs from the first argument because the first argument is focused on those in poverty now, whereas it focuses on future people. And then the third argument is about adaptation. The world has already warmed over the last century and a bit. Uh, we're already living with the effects of climate change. And so there's a sort of strong case for remedial justice to transfer technology to enable people to cope, to cope with a climate constrained world. And this means, for example, uh, let's say early detection systems for coping with freak weather events. It means investing in uh, structures that can uh, withstand um, storm surges. It means enabling people to live uh, in systems where they're facing uh, drought and, um, and crop failure. And the argument for this is a, an adaptation-based argument rather than a uh, mitigation-based one. And I think this it requires us to rethink the institution of private property in a way, because what it calls for is, is the sharing of technology and the design of technology so that it benefits all. And there's a very arresting figure that's a bit higher up on the, um, the handout, top of page six, by some uh, German, German energy experts, which said that just transferring existing technology could reduce the global CO2 emissions by roughly a quarter. Um, so there's an imperative to do this for developmental reasons and for protecting the climate reasons. Okay, so that, that is my final claim. I think a just response to climate change requires, I think, a, a global technological commons. It requires sharing technology beyond borders so that all can uh, enjoy a just standard of living without imperiling the climate. Um, I think I've got time just to sum up, Carl. I think I might do. Yeah. Yes, you do. Uh, so, um, yeah, the question really was, does tackling climate change require us to rethink institutions of private property and ownership? And I think I've advanced five uh, claims which try and link climate with notions of ownership. And the first linkage is that currently, we have treated what is a common resource as if uh, it can be privately used out without reference to the interests of others, without limit. And that's a form of unjust privatization of a shared resource. The second claim is that we shouldn't move from that or infer from that, oh, but we should treat it as like a common resource because I think the resource is almost all used up. So we shouldn't regard it in ownership terms at all. And then the third claim is, if we're serious about preventing climate change, then there will be a case under certain conditions for prohibiting the extraction of fossil fuels. They could be owned, you know, the land could be owned privately or communally. It doesn't really matter for my argument. It just says you should not be allowed to extract it if doing so predictably and foreseeably will um, lead to those being burned, which seems incredibly likely. Uh, I've added that various conditions should be added, like just compensation. And then the next claim was um, about renewables and saying these depend on very on particular resources that are scattered throughout the world. And if we're concerned about egalitarian justice, we have to be concerned that access to all of its benefits is shared equitably. And then the, the final one was this case for global technological commons. I want to end by just saying, although this might seem like quite a lot, I think this is not enough. Well, we need to do many of the other things, including one that just links in with the very last talk uh, to do with the structure of, of uh, living in the modern world and towns and cities and villages. We need to rethink infrastructure. We need to think building design. We need to think about our ways of living and our social norms and our political structures. But I do think we need to think about property rights. And so I'm really grateful to the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity to think about those. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thank you. I, uh, I will ask, um, ask whoever controls the screen to unshare the handout, please. Unshare the screen.
uh, so we can all see each other for the talk. All right. Um, now, uh, uh, hands up for whoever wants to ask a question. I am not in the room, as you can tell, so I can only see the electronic question. So somebody in the room, uh, let's see, uh, somebody in the room will have to uh, let me know. Uh, put we the, let you the know. Rooms yeah, if you could put the room's hand up when somebody in the room has has their hand up, uh, then then I'll call on you to call on them. Okay, but our first question is for uh, Michel Bourbon. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk, Simon. Um, so uh, at the very beginning of your, your talk, uh, one of the precisions you made is that to have a, a just target, we should aim for one, 1 1.5 degrees target. And I think that's uh, it's important to to spell that out. But that, then the, it has several implications in terms of uh, how we can reach this. So you you, you talked a lot about decarbonization with uh, renewables. Uh, as you're well aware, this will not get us far enough. Uh, we also need to to massively reduce consumption, and we also need something you you mentioned uh, I think a couple of times, but you set aside the, um, this idea of uh, negative emissions. Um, so to, to reach 1.5 degrees, since the carbon budget is almost completely exhausted, I think the the last IPCC report said um, in 2018 at current emission rates, just 10 years left if we want to reach this. Uh, it means that we will need uh, uh, at least small scale negative emission uh, programs and perhaps even large scale negative emissions. And the problem with those negative emission uh, technologies such as uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is that once again, there are risks of trade off with sustainable development goals. For instance, where the, the price of crops are going up, the price of food is going up. So I was just wondering uh, if you could include this into your, your approach, the idea of uh, negative emissions, and then also uh, include this idea of just targets with the idea that we need also here compensation measures to make sure that there is no such trade off be between negative emission programs on the one hand, and sustainable development goals uh, to help people develop uh, and to fight against climate change at the same time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, yes, I. Well, I'll say two things. I mean, one one thing is, I mean, there are some who think we can get there on renewables alone. Uh, I mean, there's someone in um, California called, I think his name's Mark Jacobson. Uh, and um, I mean, his views have been criticized by others, but I, I don't feel qualified to judge those. But uh, I think it's just worth mentioning some people think we can get there without negative emissions. The, um, you're right to bring in things like Bex. And I mean, one thing, it, well, I, I wanted to mention, but I thought I was just including too much, is that lots of other measures will have resource rights implications and BECS will be one because that will use land. So will many other things like afforestation and reforestation. Um, uh, these will require kind of big ripple effects on who owns what and has control of what. And already I saw reports of some people responding to, to Biden's uh, infrastructure plans, opposing it on environmental grounds that it is involving the destruction of local habitat. So I'm taking the opportunity of what you said to, to note that, uh, that the resource rights linkage um, goes beyond what I've said and would include things like um, yeah, bioenergy capture and uh, storage. But um, I, could you just clarify or add um, yeah, what further implications do you think that would have? Is it that you thought it wouldn't be possible to achieve 1.5 without having to make some difficult choices about other vital goals and interests and rights. I thought yeah. that was the subtext, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, I think the, the most important limitation to, uh, to use renewables is especially what you mentioned with uh, rare earth uh, materials. We don't yeah. have enough of those materials to ensure that everybody, including developing countries, can sufficiently use renewables. Um, I think the, the most uh, problematic uh, point is that um, if uh, we rely too much on those BEX technologies and we invest in thousands of BEX plants, then we might 
have a like a uh, very high high risk of uh, of trade off with sustainable development goals and that, that's why i think it's also important to to insist a lot on reducing consumption levels in addition to changing uh the kind of uh energy we use that that is in developed countries yeah no well, um yeah, i'm in full agreement with that i think i try to gesture it at the very last line saying that this is not enough we need to do others and and i very much appreciated uh odile's presentation to do with uh um the suburbs and, and villas because as you know because you've heard me talk about this michelle these things are invisible to many the, the ecological impact is invisible but they are momentous and so we need to to rethink all those and yeah reduce consumption I do think it's kind of interesting that the research by people like Lucas Chancel and uh, Thomas Piketty that the the top uh, ten percent are responsible for something like fifty percent of emissions is quite a uh, striking, and that makes me think that the trade offs might not be so difficult as they might otherwise be by targeting that particular that particular group. But maybe that's a topic for for another day. I, I think it's possible to have a, a just transition that meets 1.5 and doesn't um, immiserate the poor and the vulnerable, but in fact makes them better off. Yes, just just to finish very quickly, my, my uh, worry was that very often those very rich people are, are those who are the most technophiles, so they are the most ready to say, let's invest in carbon offsetting, negative emission technologies, and that's very often an excuse not to reduce their own emission. That's the kind of uh, trade-off worry I have in mind when we say, uh, we can at the same time have ambitious reduction and at the same time have very large negative emission programs. Uh, there might be a trade off here because we can conceive, uh, for very good reasons, negative emission programs as a substitute to uh, mitigation programs. And here, here is a, a high risk that we sh I think we should try to take into account. Yeah, no, well, I agree with all of that. Um, there were two things I didn't mention in the handout on purpose. One was nuclear energy, because mm -hmm. I don't endorse that. And the other one was reliance on things like bioenergy capture and storage and, uh, and carbon dioxide removal, because that's not um, something I think should play a role, or if it should, it should play a minimal role. Uh, I mentioned it only in that some people include it and then say the carbon budget is bigger than I'm saying it is. But I'm persuaded by people like Kevin Anderson on the, the dangers of going down this route. Anyway, maybe to be continued. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Michelle, you can lower your hand now. Uh, the next person in the queue is uh, Eva Weiler. Weiler. That microphone is muted. Right. Does it work now? Yes, it does. And I have to bend down. Um, <laughs> um, well, thank you for the talk. And maybe you already answered that um, my questions, but just to clarify, I thought that actually your account is more demanding that you made it seem now because, or it could be, because if you say that um, the atmosphere as a carbon absorptive capacity should not be regarded as a resource anymore because it's already used up, would you kind of distinct the atmosphere from carbon sinks like soil, forests, the, the oceans? And if not, wouldn't that have yeah, just stronger in implications than you? I mean, you said that we have to kind of limit um, property rights, but there I think you could make, or one could make a much stronger point by pointing out that um, the capacity is used up. If you don't separate um, um, the the atmosphere, the, the absorptive ca capacity of the atmosphere from other absorptive capacities of other resources, natural resources. Good. Thank you very much, Eva. I mean, yeah, it's 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 complicated because. So how how should we regard? let's say a country or community that invests in a lot of reforestation and let's assume that it effectively absorbs carbon dioxide. And I include that last bit because I, I was quite interested and excited by what they call natural climate solutions. 
that I've noticed quite a lot of experts write in and say it's not as straightforward as people think. So I don't think this is what you were saying, but someone listening to you might think, uh, okay, well, given that forests can absorb things like CO2, then the, the budget out there isn't fixed and the more people replant, then the more they, they would be entitled to pollute because um, their net effect is zero. And I think that might technically be true, but what I suppose I want to resist is people thinking along that lines, because I think we have to think for the future of humanity and we just basically have to get off carbon uh, as a form of energy. And, and so these things might stretch things out a bit and they might prolong it, but, um, but really it doesn't tackle a problem at root. Um, I'm not sure if I've got your question quite right because uh, I thought you were saying, my, my worry is that once we mention these other things like uh, natural climate solutions, then it might open the door to someone saying, actually we can treat uh, the absorptive capacity a bit like a resource because it's not fixed and running out. It's something that can be replenished through these other activities. And I suppose I'm just nervous about that because it just seems, um, if true, to be a, maybe a short-term stopgap, but the real thing is to get off a carbon-based economy. But I think I might have misconstrued what you said, so please put me straight. No, no. Sorry. No, uh, it depends. I mean, if you say it's actually already used up, I would think that would put a stop on fossil fuels and but on a, as a plus, we also have to use natural absorptive ca capacity to build it up. So that's what I meant. It, it oh. can actually, I took your account to, to uh, at least have the possibility to have really strong implications of just stopping pollution and trying to build up absorptive capacity. Great. Okay. Well, you put it better than I did. And that's what I, that's the direction I think we should head at. I think we've degraded it and we need to start replenishing and restocking it. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's better. That's a much better wording. Okay. Um, I'm at the moment not seeing other hands up. I will chime in on the nuclear power issue. I agree. Nuclear <laughs> power is the, the, cleanest of all energy sources, assuming human beings are, 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 are capable of having zero errors. Uh, then if you have any errors, you could kill uh, millions or billions of people. Uh, but otherwise, it's super clean. Uh, so, uh, uh, and one other solution, one, uh, I think, simpler, rather than auctioning things off, is uh, you can just tax the stuff at a high rate and then and so you don't have to explicitly decide who has the right to admit. You tax them for their emissions, uh, giving them incentive to cut back, and then you just keep upping that tax rate, uh, uh, forcing them uh, by their own sort of a uh, forcing them or nudging them, if you want, to uh, to uh, emit less and less as you up and up the taxes. Yeah, I mean, actually, Carl, this kind of gets close to terrain that you're extremely knowledgeable about, like permanent Alaska type funds, because some of those who favor the auctioning basically do treat it like, in fact, they make occasional reference to the permanent mm -hmm. Alaska in one way. Mm -hmm. You just auction off and you use the revenues for good purposes, mm -hmm. but you can have exactly the same effects by using a tax system mm -hmm. um, because uh, yeah, you're generating a revenue and you're allocating the scarce resource in a, a certain way. Um, and in both cases, it's to the highest bidder. The thing that worries me about carbon taxes, about which I used to be quite supportive, I mean, I thought in principle it's a good idea, is there's quite a lot of research just saying how they get um, gamed by uh, fossil fuel companies. And so they never actually get to bite and they never really work. If they were put in place and of the way that you describe, then um, that's a lot better. But there's a lot of research coming out quite recently from various political scientists on how that, and also emissions trading schemes just kind of uh, get watered down and diluted and, and so they don't really hit the companies. 
Well, I, I mean, that's really that what's really underlying all of this and the last presentation uh, about the suburban society is the power that that uh, wealthy corporations and wealthy people have over our governments. Um, and they take control of the decision making. The, 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 the big businesses operating in the market take very often take over the regulatory process. And we need an adversarial process where, where the regulator is controlled by the people and the, and the businesses operating are being strongly restricted by it and have no, and their only influence on it is do I, do I emit carbon with this tax on it or buy it with this price on it? Uh, um, and, uh, and until we have democratic reforms that are gonna give us this power, you know, the, the, once the people really control the government, there's a lot of good things we can do. And until then, uh, until then it's hard to say what's gonna work because as you were just saying, they capture, the, the businesses capture everything. Yeah, I think the, the penultimate two words of my presentation were political structures, because I agree, I think, mm -hmm. Um, we do not have political structures designed in a way to protect well, justice or the climate system. And so I often think that there's three levels. Philosophers often come up with principles. We often adjudicate policies, but there's the third level, which is getting the political structure um, and people having control of that such that we can realize the principles and the, affect the policies. And yeah, so that's why I ended with political structures, which is... Uh, no one else was to know that's what I was getting at. But yeah, I think that's a fundamental significance. Okay, we're almost out of time. Uh, but, uh, but Pierre's hand has gone up. Uh, Pierre, do you have a quick oh, question? It's actually me. Uh, oh, well, it I, says says Pierre right there. And, yeah, I, and you're I know, wearing okay. a mask. Uh, I'm using his computer because it's trying to, we, we still have some technical issues here, but well, we, we can see and hear you very clear and loud. So that's really perfect. Uh, well, thanks first for the, 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 the paper and presentation. I mean, it was really fascinating and I, I agree with like most of it. Uh, I just have a, a question, maybe on another side of the of the paper, like the, the, the idea that, well, how should we be, because, well, if you want to have technology transfer, if we want to restrict ourselves, this will create some kind of burden and the question somehow uh, I, I have, and I'm, I'm sure it's, it's more of a clarification question, I mean, um, the question is, how do we share the burden among the rich countries somehow, you know, because you clearly seem to go in the way that, well, uh, we don't uh, uh, like a just or fair transition to, to um, a green economy or something like that and with a, a zero, zero carbon uh, with zero emission. It does not mean that we have to do the same efforts, we have to do more time like countries who industrialized later. And so they did not burn as much coal as like uh, developed countries did. So the question is, okay, this will create a burden for kind of developed, developed society. And how can we, well, on one hand, implement it? I mean, uh, as Cal was saying, though, the problem is that, yeah, kind of wealthy people have a lot of influence on the government and everything. How can we get rid of that in order? And well, Cal was saying, okay, we should have, uh, the people to control the regulator and to implement really these kind of norms, but but what if the people don't want <laughs> this kind of? I mean, it, it's likely that it's not going to be very popular. This kind of idea that well, we have to cut our emissions by two, three, four. Uh, so well, forget about the SUV. That's over. <laughs> and clearly, the move for the moment is quite the opposite way. Uh, so there will be a question about how can we enforce this kind of. Uh, voluntary transition, I, I guess it must be something like acting on representations and, and trying to transform their representations. But I mean, it's, well, for me, it seems to me difficult to convince people to be to be just if it means also that they have to reduce their own standard of living. So yeah, if you have some comments on that, I, I'd be really curious to, uh, to hear you on that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and we're just about out of time, so make it quick. Okay. Yeah, we actually, I have another paper on political responsibilities. And one thing I think is striking is how many people are harmed by the current system. So people in communities where the fossil fuels are extracted are often exposed to extreme danger and environmental harm. People generally oppose the transportation of fossil fuels across their territory. 
witness the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Keystone XL Pipeline. And many people are harmed by the burning of fossil fuels. We have, I think, three times as many people died last year because of, no, three, many people, three times as many people die of poor air quality because of fossil fuels um, than died of COVID last year. Um, so there are a lot of people harmed by it. And I think the kind of the politically um, plausible route to go is to build a coalition of all of those in these harmed categories and, uh, and to explore the extent to which we can create a, a green economy you know, with green jobs. I don't know whether that all adds up because I, I'm not a political scientist, but that seems to me the, the roots of the, the kind of the politics needed, which is to build coalitions between all of those groups which are ill affected. And it does come back to the power of fossil fuel companies because they have been tremendously successful at persuading people it's all in their interests, including paying lots of taxpayers money to subsidize them. I mean, so yeah, that's, that's the beginning of an answer, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a really hard question. All right, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, now let's move on to uh, uh, Emmanuel Picave, uh, who uh, is a professor of philosophy and applied e ethics at the University of Paris One. He holds several chairs and positions, including editor in chief at the Review of uh, Economic Philosophy. If so, send your papers to him. And uh, he'll be presenting today the problematic rationality of private property rights. Rationality issues about the private and the common. Take it away. Okay, and you're muted. You're muted and your hand is up. So you can put okay. your hand down. So thanks very much, Carl, and many thanks also to um, the to to uh, the organizers for these beautiful um, research days. So I will use a series of slides and uh, I've given a slightly more developed uh, handout. Okay. Okay. Is it okay? No, it should be shared. Is it okay, Carl? We can you see uh, the can you PowerPoint? See the... Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, I can see the PowerPoint. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> so I will raise a number of rationality, basic rationality issues in a kind of naive inquiry about the state of our philosophical knowledge about this. Um, it will be incomplete, but um, quite sufficient, maybe, to raise a number of doubts. Um, so, uh, normative discourse deals with the claims about strongly protected private property rights, not just with the goal of justifying private property, generally speaking. It also deals with the limits of the legitimate claims about claim private property. The contrast between private and common features of the world, including social life, plays a role in argument about these limits. But are these arguments usually rational? In matters of property, normative argument has important effects in real life, and these consequences are objects of normative or prescriptive concern in their own right value of justification and the relevance of deliberation about these rights both depend on the rational character of argument which is not always beyond doubt so i would like to chart some of the main issues in this respect um, normative discourse about property of course raises a number of problems which have to do with social justice and first of all with the ontology of the private and the common and the very rationality of focusing on matters of privacy and private life and activities. This rationality is problematic in the collective context of social life, 
especially institutional organized social life. So, um, so I will start with a good word for private property, just checking some classical lines of argument to do with protection, utility, and autonomy. The private dimension of social life is by no means an obvious characteristic of our life context and belongings. As an elaborate normative cluster of criteria and values, it borrows much of its seduction from the connection with a number of familiar ways of justifying the claims of ownership and exclusion. Let us consider a few lines of argument in favor of a common private dichotomy and in favor of letting the private take the upper hand. First of all, given the fact that political power can become oppressive, protecting a private sphere seems to offer a degree of protection. This is likely to be of interest even to the less than liberal minds among us upon reading such masterpieces of political philosophy as the works of Plato and Hobbes, for instance, who, who can uh, uh, engender uh, fear. Protection of a private sphere is part of one of the most important success stories of modern political theories. That is to say, the downgrading of absolutist thought. In post-1776 times, especially after 1789, this success story has fostered the routine inclusion of private property and its super strong protection among the resources that enable people to resist the immoderate use of political authority and which help materialize their right to safety and happiness, even in politically dangerous times. Um, another line of argument focuses on the benefits in terms of productivity in the use of natural resources. Of course, John Locke was eloquent about this in his second treatise of civil government. Subtraction from the common pool of resources somehow connects up with enhanced incentives to do one's best in the exploitation of nature. In Locke's treatise, the powerful reason for this is the importance of predictability and safety. The laborer who sows should be able to rely on the future harvest. Otherwise, it might be reasonable for him not to sow in the first place. More sophisticated stories in post-Perician social science and political philosophy follow from instantiations of the paradigmatic collective action problem, especially in the form of the free rider problem. Indeed, the privatization of specific features of the world can also be understood as a way to limit the risk that individuals might rely on collectively procured goods and rationally abstain from contributing to their production, even though their abstention has a negative marginal effect upon themselves so that they hurt themselves in a way. Uh, this is a priori specif specifically relevant for environmental matters and the use of common pool resources in nature. Um, sorry. A third argument borrows its seduction from the autonomy ideal, being masters in their own sphere of private property individuals can create the visible objective status of free persons. Um, no matter how fanciful the pretense at reading a direct expression of autonomy in property rights might be, this kind of argument conveys the powerful idea that the structure of property rights should best be examined as a way to harmonize individual domains of discretionary choice. This harmonization process may reflect justice in the Ciceronian cuique suum uh, tribuere sort, for example, in Guillaume Duvers' uh, celebration of uh, property as a system of bounds, a system of limits, 
that enable people to live uh, harmoniously together in his uh, treatise on holy justice or else it may be viewed on more uh, modern Kantian times, Kantian uh, terms, uh, especially after the pattern of the Rechtslehre theorizing, uh, the, the first part of the Metaphysik der Sitten uh, by Kant, as a way to see to it that the composability of individual domains of discretionary choice or external choice, external use of uh, free will, is made possible in the external world, thus enabling the citizen to check that universal freedom according to a law is secured through legal and political organization. Uh, this is not to say, however, that the private character of some aspects of social life should become a countervailing force against an indefinite number and variety or possibly of plausibly uh, legitimate claims. Indeed, each of these predominant lines of argument meets surprisingly effective counter arguments, so that the widely shared confidence in private property is a mystery somehow. Um, okay, so uh, very shortly, a series of counter arguments. More often than not, private property is a tool for authoritarian political power, an, imp an important fact which has been somehow obscured by the indeniable tyranny of some collectivist regimes in the past. Giving and protecting private property is a traditional tool of political authority, including abusive uh, political authority. Um, very often, the absolute protection of the property rights of the wealthy and the will to increase the financial profitability of holding such rights are very high indeed on the political agenda of uh, uh, oppressive regimes, because support from the influential parts of the population turns out to be a strategic necessity. In addition, enhancing the effective production of pro protection of property, moving ahead of the ordinary expectations might give credentials to strong power, for example, abusive local power, or the dangerous use of the police force nationwide. Last but not least, in capitalist societies, uh, the antecedent clear-cut design and protection of property rights is instrumental in oppressively enforcing market-based solutions in many spheres of social life, even though uh, these solutions could be democratically questioned or even opposed. Concerning the second line of argument, I will simply recall um, the way they were effective. It was effectively attacked by William Godwin, targeting Locke's doctrine in his celebrated inquiry concerning political justice in 1793. If serious claims such as important human needs are frustrated by the defense of private property, it is simply irrational to protect the latter in an absolute manner, as staunch defenders of private property would have us to do in virtually any context. So this is an, eff an effective argument against turning private property into a sacred thing. In a more general line of argument, the great British philosopher Henry Sidwick has argued uh, that the proposed association of a utilitarian perspective with the strict protection of a private domain for the individual is hardly acceptable after all, even though it is seducive. The argument is twofold. First of all, it is by no means obvious that we can find a general formula to specify a personal domain for each individual. Uh, there is no such thing as a common measure for what is individual for you and me. Moreover, if such a formula were to, were to be found, if there, was, there were a genius in moral or political philosophy or in law, uh, 
will, will, found, uh, will, will could propose such a formula, it would still be irrational from a utilitarian point of view to abstain out of respect for personal domains from trying to maximize the amount of goodness in the results of action. Of course, um, this argument starts from utilitarian premises. However, it raises legitimate philosophical concerns about the trustworthiness of social constructs of personal or private spheres. If we don't have a general formula, may we claim to have a formula at all, whereby it could be argued that anything like an intrinsically personal or private dimension of life is captured through a given demarcation line. In the defense of private property, the possibility of such a trustworthy presupposition seems to be presupposed, but it is problematic. Moreover, Sidwick's argument raises legitimate doubts about the, the compatibility of any attempted demarcation uh, with a general interest perspective. Maybe the argument is more general than a, a utilitarian argument. Uh, another problem with the second kind of argument is the inability to take the benefits of collective action seriously, protecting individual action and its consequences within a tiny sphere creates in incentives to focus on immediate profitability and more particularly on benefits which one can secure on one's own terms and for one's own initiatives. Of course, commitment to effective collective action might be more profitable after all, as suggested in the classical deer hunting party in uh, Rousseau's second discourse. So I won't develop a systematic criticism about the third line of argument about autonomy. Suffice it, suffice it to mention a basic difficulty. Obviously, the quest for formal composability is a basic requirement for any process of normative building. The external use of man's will is of paramount importance in this respect, and there is still uh, active philosophical research about uh, the mutual composability of rights and so on. However, any precise structure of property rights will fall short of being justified as the best choice in order to make autonomy of freedom effective in the world. Uh, in, in particular, the connection between a general compatibility, compatibility requirement and private property rights, even when the former is associated with a general concern for personal freedom, is extremely loose. It is underdefined. Structure of rights is underdefined by uh, by composability. So uh, uh, next, I, I will stress that worldly rationality turns out to have a special affinity with practical necessities and the experience of mankind in this respect. So maybe after all, we should uh, consider very modest forms of rationality. Uh, for example, in uh, Justinian's Institutes, when we are explained that the law of the peoples is common to the entire humankind. Uh, in fact, the justification is extremely modest, modest if we read the, this classical text, because uh, it is common just because people are pressed by usage and the necessities of life. So, uh, so that people in society have given themselves laws, including laws which uh, enable people to be in communication with uh, one another across borders and so on. Um, property rights with all their variability from city to city, from state to state, may appear rational in some weak sense if they can be explained out of such acquired experience. However, it must be allowed that for all the sophistication of our contemporary theories in the field of the dy dynamics of rules and institutions, the selective choice of private property as the predominant model of property is far from obvious. Uh, 
of course, uh, repeatedly in history, it has been attacked, has been criticized. One good example is the, the work by Mably. So this is uh, Abbe de Mably, Gabriel Bonneau de Mably. Um, uh, I think of his uh, book uh, about legislation. It's one of the classic pieces of work in which the tension between private property and rationality plays a very important role. So there are many pragmatic arguments in the work. At the same time, there is an initial quotation of Cicero, Delegibus, which insists uh, uh, about the coincidence of rationality and law. And uh, the, the form of the philosophical dialogue between the, the, the English gentleman and the Swedish gentleman um, makes it obvious that uh, the defense of privilege and the attacks on privileges on a day-to-day -day basis uh, do not suffice. Um, we, we have to, to question property starting from rationality ideals, uh, even if we care about uh, very practical, very pragmatic justifications. Uh, and the direct attack was launched against the miserable opinion according to which society is impossible if property doesn't exist. And it is said by Mably that this is a shame for philosophers or the persons who are supposed to be philosophers. And this reference to philosophy and its, uh, um, its uh, strange ways is a way to question the rationality of false assumptions and to justify the study of the reasons why, the reasons why, although nature has prepared everything for the community of goods, we haven't been able to make the best of it. And of course, philosophers should be rational. So a crucial problem is that private matters are social and public matters after all, and they also should be discussed as such, but it is, it is not an easy, an easy thing. Um, so uh, you will see in the handout, I give an example about, um, about uh, higher education and another example about the stakeholders approach. Um, in the contemporary world, uh, very often uh, public debate is extremely, uh, um, extremely uh, close to private debate. And uh, in many cases, private debate, for example, private conversation between stakeholders um, is part of the public decision-making process and the public deliberation process so that we don't have uh, a clear-cut division between public and private. Maybe it has never existed after all, uh, but particularly in the contemporary world, uh, it is more or less theorized by institutions, for example, in the EU context, of course, because of the, uh, the methods of coordination, um, the open method of coordination. Uh, the stakeholders approach uh, goes in the same direction. And, and so uh, many public affairs are discussed uh, most effectively in private dialogue. And I think this is a, quite a big problem for pro private property rights because their private nature is an, invi an invitation to discuss them on a private basis or on a public private basis even though they, they are of paramount public and social importance. So I think this is a, indeed a big, a, a big problem. Um, uh, and seeing to it that private capital is financially productive is a force behind influential private dialogue. And private dialogue is more often than not, a driving force behind political moves. In spite of the harsh criticism formulated by some theorists, for example, in law by uh, Hans Kelsen, maybe you remember that Hans Kelsen uh, uh, said that there was no such thing as private law, <laughs> that uh, the 
public versus private division in law was just ideological. It was just a matter of the rich protecting property as a sacred thing and so on. So creating a kind of special, special law which could not exist for theoretical basis, for, for theoretical reasons. In spite of uh, this kind of radical argument, uh, which are well known in theory, um, practically speaking, uh, uh, we have uh, we have not only we we have private property, but we also have special protocols for discussion, for argument, for dialogue, for the filtering of reasons, which are specially designed. Uh, for the pro for the presupposed protection of private property rights, private property rights. Okay, so I will come to a number of uh, remarks about uh, the nature, rationality, and interdependence nexus. So uh, reasoning about the legitimate bounds of private property has been intrigued intricately associated across, across history with speculative views about nature, the position of mankind in nature. And uh, I think we must allow that the status of rational discourse in this respect is often uncertain. Indeed, some anthropologists like uh, Philippe Descola insist that uh, it is a cultural matter that the man uh, man nature or culture nature uh, divide is a social construct and so it is a very relative uh, relative thing uh, for example what does mixing to a natural mixing uh, one's work uh, to one's labor to a natural thing uh, 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 really mean uh, such conceptions rely on very strong hypotheses about what constitutes personal features of the world, as exemplified in Locke's second treatise, and more recently in libertarian doctrines. On the face of it, mixing up one's labor with elements of nature has a pretty unclear normative relevance, in spite of its prominence in classical and influential views about the justification of property. Um, ex examining the embeddedness of private property institutions in nature, uh, more particularly on the side of human exchange, could motivate a fresh look at a number of theoretical propositions from François Dagonier's writings. So this is François, François Dagonier, an important uh, and uh, late uh, uh, French philosopher. Um, so he had a number of important insights about this. Uh, his contribution is quite helpful because it highlights the limits of property-like boundaries. In his writings, typically, property is challenged from its own domain because property is a matter of social responsibility based on interdependence. This is the stuff of property. Uh, as there is a tension between exclusion and responsibility, property cannot just be a matter of exclusion. Nevertheless, the exclusion of others plays a major role in the complex of ideas, and in the bundles of various claims and rights which structure our thinking about property by and large. And uh, this is illustrated in the successive problems made by property concepts, and by the dynamic story of resolutions, problem solving, and adaptations. For example, in Dagonier's work about uh, property. Um, dealing with the justification of property, he remained faithful to a social value perspective. However, he found that interdependence should be the main source for normative appreciation. I think he was right. Um, uh, um, moving uh, moving uh, backward in history, of course, we could also think of some important insights in Rousseau, uh, especially about um, on the more naturalistic side of Rousseau's writings. 
uh, I think of his discussions in which he shows that uh, the structure of property rights and the exchange of property rights can be a sort of uh, destabilize, 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 destabilization in social relationships, for example, in trade relationships. And uh, 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 this, uh, this remains quite uh, interesting, especially because these arguments in Rousseau are not classic, even though the author is classic. They have been largely over, uh, largely ignored, and uh, virtually political theory has made uh, nothing of it. Um, and it's only in recent times that uh, there has been uh, an upsurge of interest in economic, uh, the economic writings of Rousseau and, and uh, the connection between economics and politics uh, in some of his writings. And, uh, and I think it is still underdeveloped. Some, some of the main arguments of Rousseau uh, are still underexploited in political theory. Um, in Loki and, and post Loki and justifications of property rights, which rely on the optimal use of resources, an additional basic problem is the global irrationality of maximizing the use of resources as highlighted nowadays, thanks to our newly acquired awareness of the, the ongoing ecological crisis. This global irrationality is in principle compatible with the instrumental or value related kind of rationality, which is established through special arguments, unilateral, unilateral arguments about the exploitation of resources in a limited context for a given subgroup of human agents. And as ecological reasoning suggests, the ability of local arguments of this sort to be decisive and to trump other kinds of reasons calls for a second look at this possible division within the spectrum of the available good reasons for action. How comes that such a division prevails? Can we remedy the process for which it conquers a prevalent position in individual and corporate deliberation. So I think this is an important uh, subject, important subject to study. Um, taking human interdependence into account inevitably leads one to raise slightly more general problems about the rational status of argumentative resources which are connected with private matters. In this respect, some of the classic problems which have to do with the delineation of a personal sphere of absolute individual claims are problems for rationality. So um, uh, this is further developed in a book I wrote about rights, claiming rights. And also in the handout, I give a few, uh, um, I, I suggest a few analyses about that, uh, particularly starting from uh, Amartya Sen's famous theorem, uh, of the, which is often called the liberal paradox. Uh, it, and it is a, a result which goes beyond the uh, Sidwick's argument, the, the Sidwick's arg Sidwick argument I, I recalled. Uh, it is more general, it does not uh, follow from utilitarian premises, but it does show that it is in fact difficult to um, to let um, uh, requirements to do with the individual use of uh, the individual uh, uh, individual discretionary choice about some characteristics of the world, uh, as we insist on in private property rights, with uh, a very general norm about uh, public goodness collective goodness, which is in his case, uh, not an ambitious uh, utilitarian view, but just uh, respect for unanimity uh, or the, the economist's uh, Pareto principle, uh, which is equivalent to respect for un unanimity in this particular conceptual setting, social choice setting. And uh, so there is simply a contradiction between uh, these two requirements, uh, 
and of course respect for unanimity is uh, is an extremely weak consequentialist uh, requirement there is nothing weaker weaker <laughs> in the consequentialist uh, world and so there is a problem and if you look at um, if you look at the result and especially if you look at the cases in which there is a difficulty the cases which account for uh, the theorem of impossibility. Um, I think one one interesting way to look at these examples, for example, Sen's uh, Lady Chatterley example, is to realize that, in fact, in these examples, uh, the interdependence of uh, the agents is extremely strong. For example, in the Lady Chatterley example, you you have a lewd agent and a prude agent, and both of them are extremely interested in what the other does, even though uh, the, the theorist has a concern for their right on private matters. For example, reading a book, shouldn't they be free to read a book, uh, to choose reading a book or not reading a book? But uh, they, are interested, they are still interested in what the other does. And so it's extremely complicated, of course, to uh, to find a collective choice uh, uh, procedure. And if you look at Sen's classical example, uh, in fact, you can easily realize that, uh, after all, uh, it is difficult to say if one of the agents wants to read or not. And so the very intention of reading the book is something unstable. It is not clear because in some cases, depending on what the other does, uh, one agent prefers reading the book. And in another case, he prefers not reading the book. So it is extremely uh, dangerous to say that he should be, he or she should be um, uh, kind of a master of a specific domain of choice, for example, uh, reading a book or not, uh, because it should be left free, he or she should be left free to do what he or she wants in this domain. This is simply irrelevant because uh, there is a conceptual, conceptual instability concerning uh, the intention of the agent his or her willingness to read. And I think this is quite typical of many situations in which uh, we are interested in separate domains of choice. And of course, private property, private property seems uh, an interesting device because it protects specific domains. It leaves people free to express their free will in separate domains. But um, provided there is a sufficient degree of interdependence, uh, this, uh, this creates specific problems. In fact, uh, this creates problems for collective decision making and problems of compatibility with even extremely weak uh, requirements concerning the common good. And uh, so this is a reason why maybe we should be interested in concepts like uh, uh, not only the private uh, and the individual, but the co-private and the co-individual. Uh, by this, I mean that in some cases, um, our choices in private domains depend on the choices of others in similarly private domains not in public domains, but in similarly private domains. And so if we start from the idea that specifying what is personal is a matter of convention, uh, which can be agreed upon, then we should, uh, then we have good reasons to consider that it should never be absolute. It should never be absolutely uh, protected because uh, really, uh, the personal is co-personal in this technical sense. Um, but of course, it is not, uh, it is not a very standard reading of uh, Sen's theorem because Sen's, I think it is for historical reasons. It is because Sen's theorem uh, 
was invented uh, in order to criticize the Pareto principle. And so it was uh, the collective uh, collective efficiency criterion which was under attack and uh, the, the basic story was that uh, it could not be so right because individual rights were important after all okay <laughs> so this is the standard interpretation of the of the the result and in fact it was important in sense uh, in sense writings uh, but i think there is a possible uh, uh, reverse uh, reading of the story in which, uh, in fact, uh, uh, sense, uh, sense theorem is a good uh, is a good reason not to be uh, concerned with absolute protection in the first place. So I will skip the conclusion because it's too late. <laughs> Thank you for attention. All right. Thanks, everybody. We only have a very small amount of time. Uh, for questions, uh, could uh, a technician there please unshare the screen so that we can all see each other? Um, and we have a question immediately from Pierre Creton. Sorry, I don't have any. Uh, it's uh, oh, the, could you put your hand down then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else have a question? It's a very weighty, dense presentation. It is hard to, to pull questions out of that. Okay, Perfect. now you have a question. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, so my, my question is: um, uh, you you described uh, uh, difficulties based on the articulation uh, between different property rights, and uh, what do you say about the incompatibility between individual property rights? and the preservation of common goods like environment, uh, uh, pollution, things like that. Yes, yes uh, I think I, I just told a few words about this uh, when I, I tried to encapsulate the substance of uh, basic arguments against the exploitation view of property rights, of course, uh, historically a very important and influential view of property rights is that uh, they should be envisioned as tools for seeing to it that exploitation is possible, uh, seeing to it that people will make uh, full use of natural, uh, natural resources. And, uh, and uh, so uh, now we know that, uh, that there are limits to this kind of uh, justification because um, there is an aggregation problem. Um, and of course, it is a, a strong reason to prefer a kind of multilateral uh, view of the exercise of rights. So we, in this field, maybe we 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 are faced with the same kind of difficulties um, uh, we found in classical contractarian theory about uh, about utility about benefits personal benefits because people like uh, rousseau and Hobbes and others were able to show effectively that uh, unilateral uh, purely personal reasoning could be conducive to personal badness, personal uh, bad results, uh, just because what happens to you uh, is explainable through the connection with what the others do. And, 
and uh, in, in Hobbes's uh, state of nature, of course, uh, <laughs> there is a, a use in omnia, but uh, it is an extremely ineffective kind of uh, personal right for everybody because it leads to, it efficiently leads to bad results. Life is short and brutish. And so, of course, concerning natural resources, uh, we face uh, more or less uh, the same kind of uh, phenomena, even in a civil uh, society where uh, we have a sovereign, we have uh, rights, we have well-protected rights. So even in the post-Hobbesian uh, post world, uh, we not only between nations, but within each nation, we, uh, we find a similar, uh, a similar situation at a new level. Okay, next question is from Lillian Croft. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this very dense and rich um, presentation. I just have a small question um, regarding one remark you made about um, Rousseau, and um, I guess also very much in like um, relation to my reading of Serre, who, yeah, as I tried to present earlier, tries to um, uh, propose an ecological reading of Rousseau and pictures um, pictures him as many others as someone who excludes um, the well the idea of nature uh, very broadly, and um, you pointed to different uh, different like underexplored areas in in um, in the literature you're looking at, and I was wondering whether you could say a bit more about what you said um, in in relation to Rousseau and that. The factor of nature um, destabilizes trade in his writings, and um, whether you would think there is actually that Rousseau is actually already like um, kind of an ecological thinker. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for this question. Um, so it's a kind of curious uh, historical fate because uh, in his time and. Uh, in the, the beginnings of the 19th century, of course, Rousseau was very much associated with the idea of nature and with a naturalistic view of, uh, of human society. And then it has somehow receded. And now in political and moral theory, uh, very often Rousseau is associated with a kind of idealistic uh, view of uh, the social contract. You insisted on that this morning. Uh, quoting, uh, quoting the, the view of Rousseau in Michel Serre. Um, and so he, he can be viewed as a, as a writer who disregards inclusion in nature in some respects. Uh, but this is a very, very strange fate. And personally, I would, uh, I would look at Rousseau more in the naturalistic fashion. Many of I've tried to show that in a, an article published in, a, in an issue of Rousseau Studies, which was in fact dedicated to Rousseau and nature. Uh, and, uh, and I found myself in, in agreement with other authors, other commentators, uh, because uh, if you look, if you take a close look at many important arguments in Rousseau's economic writings and also in the second discourse and in other writings, including social contract in some respects, you, you will find that there, are, there, there, is a, there is often a, a dependence of Rousseau's argument on uh, contingent aspects of nature, contingent aspects of man's inclusion in nature. For example, concerning the availability of things, uh, their replaceability, uh, concerning the, the natural ways uh, of, of exchange between men, and, uh, between people, and so on. And so uh, there are many arguments in Rousseau who, who are very, uh, very strongly based on natural, uh, natural contingent features of the world and also on uh, kind of natural features of human interaction. Um, for example, I, uh, in my talk, I quoted uh, the Deer Party example, which is quite important for later uh, game theory. Uh, 
um, in his uh, game, in his uh, deer hunting uh, example, uh, Rousseau uh, takes a very naturalistic uh, view of the, of the situation. Uh, it's really an exercise in natural history. And, uh, and the dependence of man on natural resources, of course, is, uh, is everywhere in Rousseau's writings, including in his literary work, for example, in uh, the, La Nouvelle Héloïse. It's a very important feature of social life, family life, uh, community life. So uh, I would not look at him as a purely idealistic writer. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. I'm a, for, unfortunately, we're, we're over time, so I have to call it there. Um...